I'm Brian Woodward, and I am married to Beth Woodward, as luck would have it. Uh, we both live and work in Salt Lake City. We live downtown, actually. I work at an ad agency, and Beth uh, works in public affairs. We moved to Utah about two years ago from the Missouri area. We moved out here with Beth's job, and we found K2 right away, so we've been at K2 a couple years now. We both went at different times. Uh, Beth went in January, and I went in June to Russia on the K2 mission trips. You know, I just spent months and months raising support and preparing so that I could go to, uh, to Russia and serve. But on the spur of the moment, I feel like God can ask us to serve at any time. I was driving northbound on I-15 back to my apartment downtown, and I saw what looked like the beginning of a traffic jam. A van carrying seven children rolled over on I-15 this afternoon. The driver was a 35-year-old woman. She died on the scene. Investigators also say there were nine children in the car, not seven as they initially thought, including an infant. There's just uh, some images that are permanently etched in my mind uh, from what I saw. As I came upon it, about 20 feet in front of me, there was a body laying on the pavement in a pool of blood. And I pull over to the side of the road and the injury I saw looked really, really bad. And I don't have, I don't have any medical training at all beyond rubbing alcohol and neosporin and a band-aid. And I was on the phone with my wife at that time and I had only seen one cop car. So I said, I ha sorry honey, I have, to, I have to go. I just felt compelled to pull over and even as I was on the shoulder of the road, I was thinking, oh, what can I do in this situation? This situation doesn't call for Brian Woodward. This situation calls for a paramedic who is trained in this and has experienced life-threatening uh, situations with people before. I, I don't have anything. I've got some clothes in the back and I have some bottled water. There was nothing in my mind that said I was qualified or prepared to help these people, but there was everything in my heart that was saying, you just gotta stop. You gotta get out and you gotta do what you can. And I thought, hey, maybe I can give this bottled water to these kids that I had also seen being walked to the side of the road to the median in I-15. Just talking to them, it was good for them to have somebody to talk to and just uh, kind of dump how they were feeling and what had happened to them. When the paramedics arrived, I was so happy, I was so glad because I was like, all right, Calvary is here. At that point in time, I, I decided that my role was over. So you got in your car and you drove back home. What were your thoughts driving home? Oh my gosh. My thoughts were, I was, I was very numb. Very numb, like, what just happened? I felt like I just walked out off a set of a movie. And I called my wife Beth right away. And the first words out of my mouth, Beth, that was the worst thing I have ever seen. I'm still processing why God had that situation for me in my life. Um, I think I'll be processing it for years. So it's, it's really ironic that I had this uh, opportunity to serve this family in this really serious life-threatening situation just a couple weeks after coming back from Russia and doing a K2's mission trip out there because they're entirely different in acts of service. Russia required months of planning and preparation. Uh, but this, on the other hand, when I was with this family on, on I-15, that I didn't have any preparation. It required uh, just a decision to do it. It doesn't matter in what situation, what country, what city, what vehicle, what highway, or what workplace. I think uh, that's what service is really all about. Just trying to be Jesus to people, because Jesus came to serve. So just a few days after uh, that happened, Brian called me and uh, relayed that story to me. Anybody remember that? It was about a month ago, I think, right? Um, so here's the... Hmm, Strangely ironic piece to the story is that 
Brian was heading northbound. He was going, he was going downtown, and uh, I was heading southbound. And, and I remember the accident. As soon as he called me, and, and uh, we were talking on the phone about there, we actually had to lunch, I think, and he was telling me about this, this moment, this really defining moment in his life. I totally knew what he was talking about because I, I drove past it on the opposite side of the wall. Um, and you know how that is. I mean, that, that's life on I-15, isn't it? I mean, it just, I don't mean to be so, so flippant about it, but it is. It happens every, almost every day, something like this takes place. And, and the irony is, is that as I drove by, do you know what went through my head? Thank God I'm not going northbound. Ouch. Because I had things to do. I had to get home to, to dinner. I had to get home to my family. I was only thinking about me. I don't know if you've ever been uh, pushed into or pressed into a situation like that, but, but sometimes we, we react like that, don't we? Like we, in our, in our hearts, and, and I, I know this stings a little bit, but it's really what happens in our hearts. We don't have time sometimes to, to be bothered by somebody else's crisis, or we don't have uh, the qualifications. I love how Brian says, you know, all I know is I got Band-Aids and some bottled water. You know, how am I qualified to even deal with this? Sometimes we feel like that, don't we? I can't get involved. I, I've got too much to do. I've got, you know, I got to go to work. What's my boss going to say if I actually stop? And what's interesting is when he told me this story, do you know what immediately popped in my head right after I was just um, confronted? I felt like the Holy Spirit was just telling me, you were driving southbound and you just didn't give a rip. Right after that thought, what popped in my head is, are you kidding me? This is like the modern day Good Samaritan tale. The story, the, the parable, you know, of the Good Samaritan that we find in God's word. Who, which one was I? I was the one who was, didn't, couldn't be bothered at that moment. And, uh, and I think sometimes we tend to not want to get involved with people's lives because it might hamper us. Um, but hopefully, hopefully that changes. And today, as we talk about if we really knew the heart of God, the, the, the sermon title today, our time together, is if I really knew God, my, my, hands, my hands would serve. And, 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 and as we spend time together today, I, I just need to say this up front. This is going to be a very elementary, practical day. I don't think that anyone sitting here is going to go, oh my goodness, I've never heard that. You're, you're probably not going to walk out of here going, stellar theological talk. This is not going to happen. It's kind of like getting back to the basics. Because what, what causes me in my heart to drive by things like this and, and just not want to get bothered and want to be involved? It's, it's, an, it's an issue of the heart, is it not? Do you, do you remember when, when cell phones first came out? They were bricks, right? And um, like you can't even put it in your pocket. I, I remember my grandfather had a suitcase cell phone. I, I thought it was really happening. And uh, he was, he was. I, I remember the, the first cell phone I got was huge, right? With a big flip. It was a flip phone, but like the lower third of it flipped. And um, as soon as I saw an accident, were you like this? I called immediately because not many people had cell phones. You remember those days? Like, oh, I've got a cell phone. Anybody got a cell phone? I got a cell phone. And, uh, and I'd call 911. I, I would be like on call in the car, driving around like citizen's emergency call guy with his big brick phone. <laughs> but now, what's the situation? The situation now is, dude, everyone's got a cell phone. Your kids have cell phones, your grandkids, and so on, right? Everyone's got a cell phone. And, uh, and they even got cell phones for dogs' collars now, so you can locate them. Everyone's got a cell phone. And, and, and so... What's your, what's your attitude driving around? Something happens. What do you say to yourself? Somebody else. Somebody else will call. Right? It's just this further distancing away from being involved in people's lives. This is interesting. A couple of years ago, there was a psychological um, experiment that took place. And uh, they, they, took this, they took this pen, this room that was hermetically sealed, and it was about, uh, it was nine feet by nine feet, and, and they figured that, that about 160 mice could live in this environment with food and water and stimuli, stimuli whatever that is for mice, and, and uh, that they would coexist and live happily. Well, after a year of this experiment, they started with eight mice. After a year, they had 2,200. I don't know how that works, but... 2,200 mice with enough food, no disease, you know, uh, the only thing that they couldn't control was, was uh, old age, you know, and uh, everything was healthy, and they noticed something really interesting. The male mice 
uh, who normally would be the leaders and be in charge and kind of, you know, make everything happen. There is kind of a pecking order with mice, so I'm told. And the, the males would actually segregate themselves into groups of 12, and they would, they would break off into these cliques. Isn't that weird? And they would become very passive and disinterested. The, the females who are, are normally the, the, the nurturing uh, mouse of the... Um, Baby mice, mice lets, I don't know what they're called. And uh, they would, you know, be nurturing and everything. They actually had an attitude change as well. They became very aggressive. And they took the, the, the little mice lets. <laughs> what do you call little mice? Little mice. They took the baby mice and they kicked them out of the family unit. And so all the mice actually moved down to one end of this room. Isn't this weird? We pay for this stuff. So I can tell you about it on Sunday morning. So all the, all the little mice went down to one end of the room and they became very lethargic and lazy and fat and all they did was eat and that's it. In two years, two years, every mouse was dead. And so they're kind of uh, checking out this this test, and they're like, (laughs) what are we learning from this? And a lot of study came out of this, but here's the bottom line. I'm going to really dumb it down kind of easy here, because um, there was a lot of of research done on this. But the bottom line was, the closer we live in in community, the more people that we pack in, uh, the, 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 the more we're we're actually tighter in community, the more it actually kind of sometimes falls apart. And you think about, how is it that I can actually drive by somebody in need? Because there's plenty of other people to deal with it. Chances are that wouldn't happen in a smaller town, would it? Chances are if somebody at K2 was broken down in the parking lot, I mean, it's smaller community here, it would be addressed. Today we're going to be talking about how this service breaks down and, and, and how, we can actually, how we can actually serve and what that looks like in our lives. How can that grow? How can we tangibly put some feet to this, this whole topic of service? So this is the last message in this series. We talked about, if I really knew God, if, uh, if you weren't here the last couple of weeks, we talked about our, my nerves would settle. If I knew who God was, I would not stress out as much. Uh, my knees would bend. If I, if I understood who He really was, my knees would bend in worship to Him. And then we talked about that my heart would grow for for my love for him. And then last week, that my ears would hear. And this week, we're going to end it this way. If I really, really knew God, my life would be categorized as a life of servanthood. And I I have to tell you, just confess up front right now, and I know you all are going to think poorly of me, but I just need to confess to you that when it comes to to service, I, I, I feel like I'm still on the operating table on that topic. And let me explain what I mean by that. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 kind of puts it this way. It's kind of an interesting uh, uh, verse when it, when it talks about the condition of our heart. When, when you came to Christ, it says, you were circumcised. Is it up there? There it is. When you came to Christ, you were circumcised. So that, that, that word circumcision, that was a practice that they did physically to set the men apart from the, from the rest of, of the world, right? To, to set apart and say, I am a follower of Jesus Christ is what they did in the Old Testament. Now, now he is saying here, uh, not in a physical sense, you were circumcised when you came to Christ, not by a physical procedure. So he's talking about something different here. He goes on to say, it was a spiritual procedure that happened in your life. And what was that? Here's the operating table. It's the cutting away of your sinful nature. See, see, God's got this dream for you, and he's got a dream for me and for K2. And that dream entails that, that he would be able to cut that sin out from our life. He would circumcise our, our hearts so that we would look and live lives that are more like him. And, and, and for me to level with you and say that when I see opportunities to serve, I have to tell you, I don't naturally jump on those things. <laughs> I don't know if you're like that, but I don't naturally like, woo, yeah, I get to serve today. Yeah, get to be in the nursery. Woo, no service for me. I get to serve in the parking lot. Yeah, baby. I, I got to tell you, and I'm being facetious here, but I don't naturally feel that way because I, I struggle with this, with this internal battle that's going on. Let me, let, let me tell you like this. Listen, if you were to ask me to, to babysit for you, um, my natural re- response would be, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> um, I don't mean to be mean or anything, but babysitting is not like really high on my list. I like my kids, not really into yours. And I'm just being honest with you. I know. Hey, and listen, I'm, I'm sharing my sinful nature with you. It's not pretty. Don't judge me. All right? <laughs> Lest you be judged. Uh, 
I'm just, I'm not really into babysitting. You probably just don't want me to do that. And if I do it, I'm probably going to charge you. And, and it's just natural. <laughs> it's true. It's this natural balance of, the, of this, this battle. It's not a balance. It's this battle that I have in my life. This battle be, be, between the tendency of, of, of my sinful nature and this battle between my, my spiritual heart. And I'm on the operating table, and, 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 and I know what's right and what God wants me to do, but oftentimes, when, when it comes to things that, that I'm not comfortable with, my answer is, uh, I don't think so. No, I'm not going to do that. Find somebody else more qualified to watch your children. You know, I, I just, I'm not comfortable with that, so I'm not going to do it. But here's the bottom line. When it comes to life, serving answers so many questions about the, the internal condition of my heart. For instance... If, if, if I could show you that, that really serving God is his design and desire for you, would you want that? If, if, I, could, if I could show you that, that serving God is, is literally, and the scripture says this, it's a great recipe for good relationships. Are you struggling with relationships right now? The word says you got to serve. That's an antidote to, to, to relationships. If, if I could show you that, that, that an antidote to unhappiness as well is a life of service, would you want that? And that, that is, it sounds like an infomercial, but that's what the Bible says. It says if you're struggling with these things, if, if you'd like to change your outlook on life, if, if you'd really, you know, ultimately want to know who God wants you to be and have a life that, that God has designed for you, it starts with a life of service. And it's uncomfortable, but I'm betting that that's the type of life that you would want. So here's what we're going to do. We're going uh, to take a look at Matthew chapter 20. And I invite you to take your program. I'm going to give you a couple thoughts to write down here. But we're going to look at Matthew chapter 20. And it's one of those chapters that it's kind of the, a backwards deal. See, Jesus was awesome by this. He, he, he would take these thoughts, these things that we would think would be normal, and he would, he would take them and he'd flip them upside down. <laughs> he would say, hey, what you think is absolutely um, 180 uh, degrees different from what I'm about ready to tell you. And it was a shocker, and he did this all the time. So, so some examples of that, like, like the Bible says, if, if, if somebody slaps you in the cheek, what do you do? You let them slap the other cheek, right? That's what the scripture says. It's, it's very counterculture, very radical, but, but that's, that's what that is. It's, it's different. It's upside down thinking. Uh, here's another example. If, if somebody takes you to court and they want your, want your shirt, what do you do? You give them your shirt and... Your dockers, no, <laughs> what's it say? Your jacket, you give them your jacket, and, and you do that, bam, see, it's turned upside down, that's what the gospel's about, is it looking at things different from what you and I are comfortable with, and so here, here we are in Matthew chapter 20, he's about ready to do that again, it's a very teachable moment, let me set this up for you, there's an argument that's happening between two brothers, James and, and John, and the argument is this, they're, they, they want to know, and they're arguing over who is the greatest, <laughs> It's such an odd argument. And, and, and so it's, it's led them to, to, to figure out where they want to sit in heaven. Because apparently, you know, it, there's a pecking order. And even at, at the dinner table, back in that culture, there was a pecking order, right? According to, to, to who you were, you would sit. Some of you have that at your family, you know, right? Dad's at the head, right? That's kind of where we get that custom. So there's a pecking order. And they want to know where we're going to sit. And they've got this great idea. Hey, what if we sit on either side of Jesus? That'd be pretty good seats. And so they go to Jesus, but they just don't go themselves. They take their cheerleader with them. Who do they take? Their mother. <laughs> so they go to Jesus, king of the universe, Messiah to the whole entire world with their mom. And they're, they're asking Jesus if they can reserve, have reserved seating so that they can be really great. This is sick. Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. Here's, here's how it starts out. Then... The wife of Zebedee came to Jesus with her two sons, and she bowed before him, and she asked him to do something for her. And Jesus asked, what do you want? And she says, promise that one day my sons will sit at your right side, and, and the other will sit on your left side in your kingdom. Basically, they're, they're calling shotgun. They, they want to, to have first rights in the kingdom of God. They want the best seat, and so they brought their mom to leverage. Because who could turn down a mom? Um, and, and before you are too rough on, on this Jewish mother, I mean, you've got to realize this is a mom who's proud. She, you know, she, she had thought through her request, and, and, and she, she wants her sons to occupy either side. She didn't want them to occupy the center. I mean, that's reserved for Jesus. She doesn't want much. She just wants either side. And so she's going to, to, to ask. And after all, these, these boys were 
you know, up-and-coming disciples, and they, they, they need to be great. So verse 24, we kind of get a sense of the, the, the problem that this caused among the, the disciples. The, the other guys were not, they weren't thrilled. And, and so in verse 24, here's what it says. When the other 10 followers, the other disciples, heard this, they were, yeah, they were angry. They were, they were, they were angry with the two brothers. I think the, the Greek fr- phrase here is um, they, were, they were torqued. <laughs> they weren't happy about this. Why? Well, because they wanted, they wanted the same thing. Isn't that interesting? Our human nature, we just all want to be great, right? Even the disciples, weren't these the guys that were picked? I mean, aren't the disciples the guys that Jesus poured his life into? Aren't these the guys that walked in his shadow and, and saw what he did day after day? Aren't these the guys that are, out of anybody on the planet, should have it together? But they don't. You know, and they're, they're fighting over greatness. And this is, they've been with Jesus for a while. And, they're, and here they are, and, and, and they're torqued off because these two guys, James and John, are the glory mongers, and they actually are mad they didn't come up with the idea and bring their moms to talk to Jesus. And so they're angry. Well, we've got to go back to verse 22. So that's the, the situation. Verse 22, here, here's, here's what Jesus, here's what he says. Verse 22. But Jesus says, um, you, you don't understand what you're asking. That, that must have kind of stung because this, this mom, she's proud of her boys. You know, she, she's proud of James and John. And then, and then he actually asks the two boys the question. He says this, can you drink the cup that I'm about to drink? So that's referring to his crucifixion, right? So the, he's going to be crucified. And, okay, let's, let's unpackage that a little bit. He's going to actually take away the sins of the world. He is the holy lamb of God. He is the, the ultimate sacrifice. He is the one that ushers in through his blood, grace, and the new covenant of the Bible. That's what that means. So he goes, can you do that? And what's their answers? Um... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can. Okay, so this isn't too difficult. Jesus, sensing a teachable moment with these guys, right, <laughs> pretty much grabs a theological two-by-four, and he goes in, he grabs his disciples, he goes, all right, so we need, we need to have a, a powwow, like a come-to-Jesus meeting, and let's, let's just talk about this, because it's not good. So here they are, chapter 20, verse 25, and here's his answer, and this is kind of a mouthful. Here's what he says, you know that the rulers of the non-Jewish people, that would be Gentiles, love to show their power over people. In other words, leaders, leaders love to throw their, way, their weight around. They, they love the power that they have. Uh, their, their important leaders love to use all their authority. The, the, the authority goes to their head. They use it. They throw their weight around. But it should not be that way among you. Disciples, this is, this is different. I'm going to change the rules right now. Whoever wants to become great among you must serve the rest of you like a, ow, like a servant. Okay, well, wait a minute. Back in those, uh, that, that does not commu- compute. Today, we don't, we don't really use the word servant. It's, 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 it's not a good deal. Back then, man, I mean, it was lifestyle, right? So if you want to become great, okay, we're going to turn it around. You have got to become a servant. Oh, man, Jesus, what are you talking about? He goes on to say it this way. Whoever wants to become first, seriously, you want those two seats? Here's the deal. If you want to become great, if you want to be first, you must serve the rest of you like a, like a slave. See, the servant is attitude. The slave part of it is this, this action, all right? Have the attitude of a, ser- of a servant and then actually do it. Be a slave. That, that's how you become great. Okay, so notice this. I kind of threw that in there to just draw your attention to. In the same way. See, this is where he's, he's kind of turning the corner here. He's saying, okay, here's the application. In the same way, the Son of Man, who's that talking about? It's Jesus Christ. The Son of Man, in other words, he's saying, I didn't come. I didn't come to be served. I came to serve others. Let me read that the way it's written. He came to serve others and give his life as a ransom for many people. Jesus is saying, I'm changing the rules here. Now notice, he doesn't deny greatness. You would would think he would say, hey, you should not want to be great. You shouldn't want to be first. But he didn't say that. I think think the reality here is that that God has created you for greatness. Now some of you, now that doesn't compete. You're thinking, are you kidding me? God has created you for greatness. 
He, he wants you to be great because if he is the one and the strength and the spirit behind you, who gets the glory? God. If you're great and you are a servant of God, he is great. He wants you to have greatness. But here's the, the, the deal. He just re, redefines what greatness is. He says, guys, you're arguing over greatness. I, I understand that. And you want to do something great because I created you to do something great. But here's how I'm going to define it. If you want to be great, you have got to humble yourself and you've got to, to serve. That has got to be the definition of of your life. And I have to tell you right now, especially for the men in here, that just shatters stereotypes that we think about ourselves, isn't it? That, that does not work. You think about just even how this culture and this society is set up, right? When, when I climb the ladder and make it to the corporation and blah, 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 and get all up and in my corner office and all that stuff, I am actually the one that gets served. I, I, don't, I don't do the, the floor jobs anymore, right? I'm the one that, that people report to. I'm the boss. I'm the head honcho. Our whole entire government's set up like that. The military's set up like that. You know, the, the business world. Uh, and even, even the person down at the bottom, he knows not to buck that. The laborer, the worker comes in, punches the clock, does his deal, tries not to get fired because if he gets fired, he's called unemployed. And so you don't want to be unemployed, so you make the boss happy. And that's the way the system works. But Jesus shatters that stereotype. He says, no, listen, it is, it's backwards. You can have greatness. And that greatness is a desire I put in you, but you're going to get that by serving people through attitude and through action, being a servant, being a slave. And I need to tell you, these guys are stunned because we, we don't live in that culture today. If you were back in that culture of that day, you would, you would understand how stunning those, those comments were, especially for the men, especially for us guys. And the reason I say that is research shows that women are three to four more times likely to serve than men. It's true. Why? why? Why are women more likely to serve? Why do you think? Because women are better human beings. Would you agree? <laughs> you guys are like, dude, not cool. You just turned on us. So before you women get all excited and everything, I just want to remind you about a little woman named Eve. You know, she kind of blew it back then and everything. So um, it wasn't a great day for females, so don't get too smug about it. But anyways... <laughs> Generally speaking, women are much better servants than men, will give of their lives much better than men will. I, I think that's the way you were created. That, that is the design of who you are. Men, you're not off the hook. Because God says, you were designed for greatness and you're going to have that through servant. I think sometimes we think of servanthood as, uh, oh, I don't have that gifting. Too bad. You know, we say that about evangelism. Evangelism is a spiritual gift, right? It's, it's a spiritual gift found in the New Testament. We say, oh, I can't talk about Jesus Christ. I don't have the gift of evangelism. Eh, wrong. We're all called to share Christ with people. We're, we're, we're called to share about what God's doing in our life. Same is true with, the, uh, with servanthood. We are all called to serve. All right, so we got to go back to, to Matthew uh, chapter 20, verse 28. That little tiny words, uh, that little phrase I pointed out there, he says, in the same way. In the same way, in the same way, you are to do what? He says, you, you are to be like me. This is mind-blowing. Here's Jesus, God in the flesh, Jesus Christ saying, I didn't come to serve, I, I didn't come to be served, I came to serve you. Another, one, of the, one of the titles for, for Jesus Christ is King of Kings, King of Kings. That's, that's one of the titles for Jesus Christ. Now, wait a minute, isn't a king supposed to be served? And here we have this kingdom backwards, just upside down. He's saying, my life, Jesus is saying, my life, my ministry, who I am is characterized by serving. Okay, now if we fast forward in the, in the New Testament and just go forward a couple books, we find John, again, James and John, we find John, who probably at this point, as Jesus is talking to him, wants to kind of slink away. He wants to pull a mulligan and be like, oh, words are coming out of my mouth. I don't even know how to get them bad. Bad idea, James. You're a horrible man. He shouldn't have brought me into this. You know, he's probably just wanting to backpedal. But a few books later, we find that John authors some other books, First and Second, Third John. And in these books, he comes to another realization. So you can see there's growth in John's life throughout this period of time. Here's what he writes in First John chapter 2. He says this, and it's like he gets it. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. If you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, if you claim to, to make him Lord of your life, 
I'm not talking about being religious here. I don't really like that word. I'm not talking about being spiritual. I don't know what that means. It's such a weird word that we throw around today. I don't know what that means. I'm not even talking about being a Christian. That, that word is, is a little nebulous too now. What I'm talking about is if you claim to love Jesus Christ and follow him with your life, it's going to be characterized by a life that walks as Jesus did. And how did he do it? He served. That's what he did. He did it. And John gets this, the same guy who was trying to uh, negotiate for a seat, right? He gets it. He says, you've got to live like he lived. Now, I told you early on, this was going to be a very practical time together. And here it is. I want to ask you, what does service look like in your life? What does it look like in your family, in your workplace, in, in school, in the communities, in the neighborhood, on the street that you live, with your kids? What does it look like? And I, this morning, in just the balance of the time that we have, I want to be really, really practical here. And, and, and in order to answer what, uh, what, what it looks like spiritually in your life, what, what service looks like, you got to kind of uh, figure out where you're at spiritually. you got to figure out where you're at on the journey. There, and I, I, would, I would suggest that there's three type of people that are sitting in here today. Maybe you find yourself in one of these camps. I, I think there's one type of person who's sitting here saying, dude, I, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I, I've totally committed my life to him, and I'm doing that. And, and I'm going for it. And, and, and I, I want to align my, my life with God's desires. That, that might be you. That might be one group of people. I think there's another group of people that are saying, yeah, I totally, I, I show up, I totally am a follower of Jesus Christ, but pretty much nothing's happening. <laughs> you know, I, I, by self-admission, I have spiritual apathy. I'm just not doing anything. And um, I'm kind of struggling in my spiritual journey and Move on to the third group. All right, so here's the third group, and this might be you sitting here, and maybe you're sitting here today saying, I'm checking out this whole God thing, and, and I, I don't really understand it yet, but I'm, in, in, I'm investigating, I'm curious, you know, I'm, I'm looking, looking to see what's going on. Maybe somebody invited you here today, and you're just kind of taking it all in. So, how do you serve really is determined by which camp you kind of fall into, and there might be some other ones in between, but I think those are the three major ones. And here's the deal. In the first camp, if you are fully committed to Jesus Christ and you are saying, I, I'm, a, I'm a follower, why do you serve? And if your answer is, I serve because that's God's greatest desire for me, I serve because, because I want to bring him glory, I think you're getting it. Because service is how God, it's the tool that God uses to form our character. <laughs> and see, the more you serve, the more you get it. And the more God works through your life. And, it, and that is God's dream for your life, is that he would be exemplified through you. And that's how he transforms your character. I think the second camp of people, people that are, might be struggling, struggling in their journey with God, might be kind of feeling spiritually apathetic, I think, I think the antidote for that is, is to ask yourself, <laughs> um, why is there distance in, in between? And, and when it comes to serve, I'm going to suggest that, that probably it's because you're not doing it. I think one of the coolest things to get back into relationship with God and really start to see him work and, and see his life-giving power in your life is through service. And I believe that is the true antidote for spiritual apathy. And I think there's, there's this third camp of people who you may not consider yourself a follower of Christ. You're, you're not sure, sure where you're going on that, but you're checking it out. And the question I would pose to you is, so what do you want in life? See, if we sat down just over coffee and, and just asked that question, what do you want in life? If we didn't know each other very well, um, we, we'd give some surface answers like, I'd like a house paid off. <laughs> I'd like at least one car that runs, you know? I might get a little bit more extravagant. I'd, I'd love to be able to pay for college, blah, blah, blah. And we have our list, right? But, but if we really started to pull back the layers of our heart and I were to ask you, what do you really want in life? I'm, I'm willing to bet after a period of time, you might start giving some answers like, dude, I just, I really want to be loved. I really want to have significant relationships or security or, 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 or really experience peace or contentment of my life. Or how about this? I'd really love to have purpose in my life. I, I don't know if that's pretty close to what you would say, but I'm willing to bet it, it, it's on target. And what Jesus is saying here in Matthew chapter 20, he's saying, if that's the life you want, that, that's greatness right there. If that's the life you want, it's found through service. You, you, want, you want contentment in life? Jesus says, you got to serve people. You, you want to really, really experience significant relationships? He goes, 
Serve people. You, 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 want, you want purpose? You gotta serve. No matter where you're at spiritually, God is saying, you, you, got, you gotta serve. You gotta do that. Why? Because that's the way he wired you. Now, practically, oh my goodness, I have five seconds. <laughs> I'm not gonna get in it. Um, practically, what does that look like? What are the next steps walking out of here? To serve. I wanna give you three. Three things you can start with, with really getting service back in your life. And here's the first one, is start, <laughs> start serving without an invitation. I think the, the word here, the key word here would be preemptive. Um, in other words, don't wait to be asked to serve. <laughs> how, many, how, many, how many people in here get tired of asking for things to be done, right? That's no fun. You don't, you don't, feel, you don't feel loved when you, when you have to ask. If you really want to serve people, you do it without being asked. You just take action. You just step out and do that. Jesus did that in, in the book of Luke, chapter 18. He went up to the blind beggar and he, he, he asked an amazing question. He goes, hey, what can I do for you? What, what can I do for you? That, that, is, that is like the key question of a servant. What, how, how, can I, how can I help you in your life today? What, what is it that you need? That's what Jesus asked. In John 13, Jesus didn't wait for an invitation to, to wash the disciples' feet. He just did it, and it freaked them out. They didn't know what to do. They were like, hold on. He didn't ask. He did it, and he used it as a moment to teach them. In John 21, he did it again. And see, this is not... This is not Rocket science, because also Jesus healed people, right? And he cast out demons. He did these amazing miracles. But in John 21, do you know what he did to serve people? He cooked breakfast. <laughs> they were out fishing, and he, and he made a fire, and he cooked breakfast. And he came in. Why is that in the scripture? So we pick up on a recipe? What, you know, what, why is that? In, because he served. The bottom line is, you start with, with small things, which is number two, start, start uh, serving without an invitation. Number two, practical step that I want to give you today is start with the small stuff. I think when it comes to serving, oftentimes you and I think serving equals big stuff. You know, I, I think about Brian up there and he goes, man, I was all prepared and ready to go serve in, in Russia and he and I went to Russia together. It was awesome, but we prepared months and months and months for that. If, if some of us prepared months and months and months for dates with our wife, they would rock, wouldn't they? If we prepared for like five minutes, they'd rock, right? And, and so obviously, when you think about serving, sometimes we think of the big stuff. Like, like, like and, and, and I don't want to say any of this is bad. This is all good. Serving. Oh, how can I serve at K2? I should go feed, uh, feed some folks, some of my friends down at the park, right? I should, I should do extreme home makeover in the summer. I should, I should go to Honduras. Do you sometimes get in that trap of thinking service equals mission trips and service equals this and that? And that is. That is serving. And it's great. And it's good. I'm not, I'm not knocking it. We need to do those things. Those are phenomenal experiences. But what we're learning here from Jesus is, hey, okay, big stuff is great. What about the small stuff? Are you willing to serve in the small areas? I, I think this was a major teaching of Jesus Christ. This is, this is very pivotal. He emphasized the small stuff all the time in his ministry. Check this out, Matthew 10. Here's a small thing. Jesus says, if you give a cup of cold water, okay, how, how insignificant is that? <laughs> if you give a cup of cold water, he said, to the least of my followers, you're going to be rewarded. You're serving. You're, you're serving. I'm, I'm going to bless you for that. And, and sometimes, i got to tell you, I, just, I don't do good in the small stuff. I think most of the time, we don't do good in the small stuff. And we miss it, we blow it. Case in point, I mean, this happens all the time. Beth and I will go out, or she'll get dressed up, and she just looks dynamite. And um, just beautiful. And, and I'll be thinking that. I'm like, dude, she looks hot. And I'm thinking that. And we get in the car, and we're driving along, and, and she'll go, <laughs> so, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, are you kidding me? You look great. <laughs> you look amazing. And now it just looks like I'm making it up, right? But I'm, I'm thinking it. I'm thinking, man, you look awesome. But see, servant, servanthood is loving and encouraging and, 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 and building other people up. It's serving them. Allowing God's love to work through your life for other people. But I blow it. I miss the opportunities all the time. I, I think of another op, uh, incident the other day. We got this, this van. Oh, my goodness. We've entered the land of suburban vandom. And, uh, but it's, I mean, it's, if you're going to get a van, you've got to get one at least with automatic doors so that, you know, some people go, oh, it's a van. Ooh, it has automatic doors, you know? So I think it kind of cancels itself a little bit. But 
so I got this little key fob. It's got two buttons on it. And the cool thing is, is you can be like 100 feet away. You can hit the two little buttons and the doors open. And, um, you know, people who are into minivans go, oh, you know, <laughs> and it's, and it's, it's sad. It's a sad life right now. But the, the doors open up and the girls pile in and it's like, hey, hey, cool. And you can get in the car and you just hit two buttons again and the doors close. Because I don't want to be opening and closing doors. So you just hit the buttons and they close by themselves. And we're driving down the road and Beth, and she's, if you know my wife, she's just so sweet. She would never say anything, you know, to, to dig at me or anything. She's not wired like that. But she just said something. And this was such a prompting, I think, from God. She said, you know, I really like it when you open my door. Oh. And I'm like, dude, I don't have a button for that. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> dude, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> it's just a great reminder again. It's the small stuff, isn't it? Why, why? why? Why do I miss the small stuff in life? Because somewhere along the line, I feel like if I hit the good stuff, if I hit the big stuff in life, I'm all right, right? Because somehow, somewhere, that counts in some galaxy somewhere on a spiritual resume that I get to pull out every once in a while and say, hey, look, I'm a good guy. Because I hit the big stuff. But Jesus is saying, listen, it's more about the small stuff than it is the big stuff. Are your antennas up? Are you allowing me to, 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 to give you the strength? And, and are you going to be the conduit through which the world gets served? Start with, without an invitation. Just do it, he says. Start, start with the small stuff. And then start anticipating rewards. And I've got to end on this. Jesus said, if you do this, we, we won't read the verse, but John 13, 17 says, if you do these things, I'm telling you, God says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. And we come full circle. Significant relationships are blessed by people who serve. <laughs> Purpose is found through serving. Fulfillment in life is found through serving. And God said, that's the key. You want to be great? Not only just be, be a leader among leaders or just, just be an influencer or, or be a world changer or just have a, a greatness in your heart and, and, and just, just have happiness and joy. He says, it starts with serving. It starts with serving. <laughs> and that's, that's what Jesus did. Yeah, he, he did huge miracles. But again... Quietly, without invitation, kind of under the radar, cheerfully, graciously. He pulled out a pan and he washed a bunch of dirty feet. And that's our example. Hey, Mike, why don't you come up here, man? I want, I want to end on this, this quote. Erwin McManus, um, amazing author, Phenomenal preacher and uh, pastor of a church in L.A. called Mosaic Church. He writes this. He says, there's something mystical about servanthood because God is a servant. And when we serve others, we more fully reflect the image of God. And our hearts begin to resonate with the heart of God. We may never be more like God than when we are serving from a purely selfless motivation. And this morning, I want to leave you with those thoughts. Again, it's kind of back to basics. But the reflection of, is your heart resonating in servanthood with God's? Are your antenna up for opportunities to show God's love for other people? Or are you just focused on yourself? Because if I really knew God, because he's life-changing, if I really knew him intimately, I mean, there's, there's no question. My hands would serve. My life would serve. And I think it starts with just saying, God, use me. Now listen, here, here's the thing too. Ser serving is, isn't easy. Oh man, it's uncomfortable. Because see, suddenly, <laughs> your agenda gets pushed aside, doesn't it? Your comfort gets pushed aside. Your pride gets pushed aside. The things that you're going to accomplish in that moment take a back seat. And it becomes about others. It becomes about living beyond yourself. 
And it starts with saying, God, use me. And here's the last thought. Can you just imagine with me if that characterized k to you? I mean, seriously. When, when, when people think of K2, they don't think of, oh, check out the band. Because <laughs> we don't have one today. Or, look at the lights. Or, wow, their artwork is amazing. And their t-shirts are cheap. You know, all these things. But they said, that is a church of action. That's, that's a church that serves. And even that song that Mike sang earlier, How's that going to start? It starts with your two hands. It starts with my two hands. And it starts with praying, God, would you use me? So what's it going to be today? As you leave this place, I want to challenge you to chew on this thought. Who is it? It might be your spouse sitting right next to you, your kids. It might be that guy in that cubicle next to you or the dude on the football team or whatever that just needs to really experience God's love and it's going to come through your heart. Because you, you, you can muster it all up yourself? No, because cause you said, God, use me. And guess what? When you pray that, God uses you. <laughs>